So for those of you who didn't see my last few videos, I've been getting more into the things that I used to enjoy as opposed to poker day in, day out. And one of those things is soccer. I played pretty much my whole life, including college. But then when I got more into gambling, I stopped playing as much, which is pretty sad if you think about it. So like I said, I've been trying to do things I enjoy instead of things that I think will make me money, which is a slippery slope, but you know, Everything's okay in some form of balance. And today it's gonna to be soccer night. So I figured I'd report to you guys from here. We're gonna go over a session I played on Wednesday at Hustler Casino Live, similar to my last couple of videos. And that's really been the story of my month, just playing on Hustler around once a week, trying to win. And then, you know, on other days I do things like this. Let's go straight into some hands. But uh, actually before we do, I wanted to let y'all know that I'm gonna be going to Austin in October for a few days, actually meeting up with Rampage where we're gonna be playing a few streams. And I might jump into this heads up tournament that they're gonna have there. So some travel coming up as well as Vegas shortly after that. So you guys can expect some vlogs from the road. But that's all I got for now. I'm gonna go kick the ball around. Meanwhile, you guys can watch some poker hands and I'll check in with you guys after my game. See ya. All right, everyone, here we go once again. Today there's quite a few hands, so we're gonna go a little bit quicker than normal through these analyses. Otherwise, this video would be like an hour long. So in the first one, we raise it up to 300 on the button playing 25-50-100. I have seven six offsuit and get called by just Mike in the big blind with five three suited. Fair fight, we go to a flop of six six four. No longer fair as I've got three of a kind. Mike does, however, have an open-ended straight draw, so when I continue with a bet of $200, he now check raises to $600. I, of course, I'm going nowhere just yet, so I call in position, and we see a 9 on the turn. Shouldn't really change anything. Mike continues betting, this time $1,200. And since I have a 6, I think it's unlikely he's got anything strong. Instead, he probably has like a flush draw, a straight draw, perhaps a 4 that randomly decides to raise for protection on the flop and continue betting. Not really sure Mike X can be a tricky player. So I decide to call again. Don't want to raise and blow him off the hand. Rivers the jack of diamonds and now Mike X bets once more, $2,400. For half a pot sized bet, I think I should definitely be raising for value. If he had bet like pot and a half or double pot, perhaps I would just call. But against this sizing, I do raise it up to 7,600. As you guys can see, Mike X has missed his straight draw, so he reluctantly folds and we win this first hand of the night. Next, I've got Ace Jack in middle position. Will raises to 300 and against an early position open with Ace Jack unsuited, I'd usually just mix between raising or sometimes folding, although that seems a little bit tight. So I do make it 1200 this time. Will makes the call and we go heads up to a flop of 7-5-3 with two diamonds. I've got the Ace of Diamonds and two overs, but this is a board that's generally gonna favor him a little bit more which means I'd be checking more often. As such, the times I do bet, I'm gonna go a little larger. This time, that's what I do. $1,800 as a continuation bet. Will makes the call with his overpair, and we see a king of spades on the turn. Good card for me to continue betting, I think, so I do put in two-thirds the size of the pot. 4,400 bucks, but Will is undeterred. Despite a king being out there now, he hangs on for another bet with his pocket nines and gets some help on the river with the nine of spades. Checks it over to me, and on a run out like this, I'm not really sure if continuing to bluff with my exact hand makes much sense. So I decided to give it up and check it back. Thank goodness I did, because we probably weren't gonna get Will to fold a set. Win the first hand, lose the second one. Even footing so far, let's see what happens on this third one with queen eight. I'm in the straddle for 200. Henry raises late position to 500. Andy calls in the big blind and I defend. 
with queen eight unsuited as mentioned. We go to a flop of jack nine nine with two hearts, which gives me a straight draw and a very weak backdoor flush draw if you think about it. So Andy checks, I check, Henry now continues betting 800 bucks. He's flopped three of a kind. Don't blame his bet whatsoever. Andy folds and now it's back to me. And on a board like this, I think we should have hands that definitely check raise from time to time, both as strong ones and weak ones. Queen eight unsuited, perhaps a little bit too wide, but I think at a very low frequency, it's okay to do it. So that's what I do this time. I raise it up to 2,400. I'm also considering the fact that Henry does tend to continue betting a little bit too wide in my personal opinion. Who knows what's actually correct but anyway i raised it up to 2400 unfortunately for me henry was not wide this time at all as he's got three nines so he decides to raise it up which is a little bit unorthodox especially being in position i do like this play but i wonder how many times he can be bluffing with this exact line anyway i decide to fold right that's the logical play yep i agree with you but no for whatever reason i'm feeling a little gambly tonight and i decide to call in hopes of bluffing certain runouts like a heart and of course if a 10 comes that would give me a straight it is a little bit dangerous though because the board is paired so we could occasionally be up against a boat even if we make our straight and that's the main reason why i think we should be folding aside from the obvious fact that queen eight offsuit is a trash hand and we're out of position anyway without becoming too long-winded i make the call and we see a good card on the turn it's the ace of hearts which does complete the flush i consider leading for a little bit but decide to just check it and if he checks back i'm gonna bluff the river assuming it's a blank so that's what i do i check henry does check it back and we see the six of spades on the river now it's time to try to steal this pot if i had a flush i'd bet around two-thirds the size of the pot so that's what i do with queen high ten thousand five hundred dollars henry does not love the situation as you guys can see and i certainly don't blame him if i have three nines and this is the action i faced i would definitely think my opponent likely has a flush or a better nine maybe but henry has seen enough of my shenanigans to know that that's not necessarily true so after quite a long think he does make the call and we lose against nine eight clubs nice hand henry and i'll be the first to say an unnecessary yet valiant attempt from me i think Anyway, this means we are now stuck on the session and have our work cut out for us. The very next hand, action folds all the way around to Andy, who raises up the action to $900. Will calls in the big blind, and I am in the third blind with Queen-10 offsuit. Nick straddled on my left, so I don't think calling is really ideal. This hand doesn't perform well multi-way, and Nick could easily squeeze us out of the pot. So I think the best course of action is to mostly fold and once in a while get aggressive in position with an offsuit Broadway like this. This time I do decide to go for it. I make it $4,000 to go. Interesting developments is Andy, who is the original Razor, lets go of his cards, but Will comes along once more. This is what I would consider the ideal situation because Will has already somewhat announced the strength of his hand by not re-raising Andy originally. And on the other hand, I could have all sorts of strong stuff since, you know, I made it 4,000 pre-flop. On top of that, which of course I don't know in the moment, we have Will in terrible shape as we both have a 10, but I've got a better kicker. So things looking good until we go to a flop of nine, six, deuce, two clubs, one heart. Absolutely nothing out there for me. And not just that, but this is typically a board I'd probably check with over pairs once in a while anyway. So when Will checks it to me, I check it back. Definitely not giving up on the hand just yet, but still trying to check back a lot of hands on a board like this. Sadly, Will has flopped himself top pair. So when the turn comes to four of diamonds and he leads out, I don't really think continuing would be very beneficial to me. So got a little adventurous pre-flop, but don't want to get stubborn on this kind of board. I let it go and Will takes this one down. Now this next one is anything but normal, I think. This hand begins with Henry opening the button to 500. Mike X and Andy make the call, and then Will puts in a really small re-raise to $2,000. Looks pretty weak to me, and then I look down at pocket fours next to act. Really strange spot because cold calling probably won't work. Henry is prone to re-raising and definitely will do it if he senses some weakness. And with Will having raised small and me just calling, I think he'll definitely try to take advantage. I also don't really want to fold because, well, I've got a pocket pair, let's be honest. But looking back, I do think a fold would have been the smartest play. So that only leaves re-raising and trying to get Will heads up. But with pocket fours, do we really want to be doing that? Probably not. Seems like an overplay slash punt. However, I do go for it this time. In theme with this video so far, I'm in a violent mood for whatever reason. So I raise it up to 4,500. Don't need to go too big to accomplish what I'm trying to do. 
Henry seems to disagree with that, though, and I don't blame him. He's got Ace King. He puts in a raise of $16,500 total. Everyone else folds, including Will with his Ace 10 off suit, who is to blame for starting this whole Pocket Fours adventure. And now it's back on me. Now, I've played with Henry quite a bit and don't really want to go too deep into the weeds about what's going on in my head at this point, but I just didn't catch vibes that he had a hand he was super comfortable with, like a big pair. Instead, I put him more on like Ace King or Ace Queen. I know it sounds like some mumbo jumbo illogical type of analysis, and it probably is, but that's the vibe that I caught. So I decided to send that in there with pocket fours. Henry does have Ace King and makes the call. So we managed to get it in, I guess, good, since we do have the best hand right now. 54% to win. We decided to run it twice. I win the first one with a full house, technically. But Henry hits a king on the second board, and we chop this one up. Each one of us profiting around $1,700. So a whole lot of nothing in the end. If I'm being completely honest, this was kind of a disaster from me. Sending in my entire stack with pocket fours is just asking for trouble. Luckily this time, it was an ideal situation in the end, but not something I want to be doing very often, if at all. Anyway, that moves us to the following hand where I've got ace nine just a few minutes later. Andy opens the button to 300. I re-raise from the big blind. I've got a suited ace, for sure worthy of a re-raise, especially against the button raise. So I make it 1500. Andy calls and we go to a flop, which for ace nine of clubs, I'd say is above average. 10, seven, six, all clubs. Could go either way here between checking or betting. We do have the nut flush, of course, but 10, seven, six is generally gonna favor Andy more than me since I was the one who re-raised pre-flop. So I decided to check it. Andy checks it back with his middle pair, and we see another not-so-great card on the turn. It's the Jack of Diamonds. Now, when I say not-so-great, of course, any card is totally fine by me since, again, I've got the nuts. But, again, picture all my overall hands, not just the one I happen to have at this moment. Jack is better for him than me once again, so I decide to check it. But Andy still doesn't take the bait and checks it back. River card is ideal, however. It's the seven of diamonds. In the moment, of course, I don't know how awesome this card is, but y'all can see here, Andy has rivered three of a kind, and it doesn't seem like I have much. So when I finally do decide to bet for $1,500, something I would be doing with ace 10, any jack, any overpair, etc. Andy decides to go for some value. I don't blame him. He makes it $6,900 to go. Now it's back on me, and I quickly make the call, but looking back, I do wonder if there's some value to putting in another raise. If Andy had a set or two pair at any point in this hand, he likely would have bet earlier, which I think means that he's either got a seven, a straight, maybe jack 10, or some sort of bluff, and all those hands we are beating with the nut flush. So I wish I hadn't called as a quick reflex, but instead found a creative re-raise on this river, despite the board being pair. And I could occasionally do that with hands, like I said, ace 10 with the ace of clubs, maybe ace jack with the ace of clubs, these sorts of hands that can bet for value on the river and then turn into a bluff. However, that's not what happens. I end up just calling and we win this one, but probably could have got a little more. Not my proudest hand by any means, but life goes on and it goes on to this following hand where I downgrade from ace nine to ace eight. And this one, I open up the button to 500 with the straddle being on. Nick Airball re-raises from the small blind to 3,000. And then Henry cold calls the 3,000. Back to me now, and with Ace-8 offsuit, it's definitely not strong enough to call. I feel like I've been saying that a lot on today's video, but it's been one of those days, I guess. So I decide to pounce on what I think could be some weakness. Nick Airball is certainly capable of re-raising the small blind with a bunch of hands against the button raise. As you guys can see here, he's got what's called the nut low, three high. And now Henry cold calling on his left, I imagine is not the strongest hand ever because if he did have something really good, he probably would have re-raised Nick Airball himself. So I think Henry's got a hand exactly like the one he's got. Pocket tens, pocket nines, maybe hands like queen jack suited that want to see a flop, etc. So I elect to get aggressive and try to capitalize on what I think is an ideal situation for me. I make it $8,500 to go. Nick airball folds his three high, very disciplined. Henry comes along once again with his pocket tens, which is good, I think. Even though I know he's likely got a better hand than ace eight off suit, we can win on all sorts of boards. Queen 10, eight rainbow, probably not gonna be one of them though, since he flopped himself middle set. Of course, I don't know that, and I would still be betting 
any sort of strong hand myself on a board like this. So when he checks, I bet 5,300 bucks. Henry makes the call and we see an interesting turn card. It's the queen of spades. So now it's a little tricky because if he's got a queen, he's obviously going nowhere. But do I really want to check back with bottom pair? I think the answer is sometimes yes. But we could also target folds from hands like Jack-10 suited, pocket nines, maybe the occasional ace-10 suited. All sorts of slightly stronger hands that we would benefit from betting against. So when he checks, I do decide to continue betting. Don't want to go big here though, so I put in $11,000, right around a third the size of the pot. Henry, of course, has the dream situation with tens full of queens. So he calls once again. River is even weirder now because it's the queen of diamonds, which means if I had aces, kings, of course, a queen, I'd definitely be going for it. But with that being said, Henry is really, really sticky, at least in my experience with him, meaning he does not like to fold. And after he calls the flop and the turn, I think it's obvious he's got at least a 10 Maybe even slow played aces or kings himself once in a while. Maybe pocket jacks, um, pocket tens, certainly possible. And of course, he could have a queen himself that he's slow playing. So I don't know. It seems like a little bit of a kamikaze bluff to go for it here. But like I said, if I had aces, kings, or four of a kind, I of course would be shoving all in. So I think about this one for quite some time and decide to wave the white flag and check it back. So it's a little bit frustrating when I see Henry turn over the one hand that might have folded against an all-in. <sighs> I guess we'll never know. We lose this big pot, $53,000 going towards Henry's way, and I am left wondering whether or not I should really be getting this out of line with Ace-8 offsuit, but at the bare minimum, it's good for the show, and I really don't regret it too much. Just an unfortunate run out. Moving on to the next hand where I upgraded this time from Ace-8 offsuit to Ace-Jack. Huh? Yeah, that's a way better hand. Don't be so quick to judge. In this one, Brown Bala opens up the button. Will calls in the third blind and I am in the straddle. I decide to just call. Could mix here between raising and calling, but this time I just flat and we go to a flop three ways of 10-8-4 with two hearts. I've got some backdoor potential as well as two overs. So when it checks to Brown Bala and he bets, I decide to come along once Will folds. We don't get any help on the turn though. It's the three of clubs. I check it to him again and this time he value bets again with top pair. I let it go now and Brown Bala takes this one down. So that one wasn't very interesting. This one I think is the opposite. Action folds all the way to me in the big blind and I look down at 10-9 suited, the diamond variety this time. Straddle is on, which means there are two players left to act on my left. If I was second to last, I might limp along, but with two other opponents in the hand still, I decide to raise. I make it $800. Nick Airball re-raises me once again. This time he's got a little bit better than three high. Pocket aces. Makes it $3,100 to go. Henry folds and when it gets back to me, we're pretty deep and I've got a hand that plays well post-flop despite being out of position. So I make the call, although I think maybe getting adventurous with another raise it's worth considering here a small amount of the time. Not this time. I keep it standard and call. And we flop top pair as we go to a flop. Nine, six, five with a diamond out there. Pretty good board for me. I've got top pair, backdoor flush drop, backdoor straight draw, backdoor trips draw, backdoor quads draw, backdoor full house draw. I mean, my hand is super strong, as you guys can see. I check it over to him. Nick Airball checks it back, which on a board like this, I think makes some sense. And we see the three of clubs on the turn, which shouldn't change much at all. At this point, I decide to lead out. Would also be doing this with bluffs like Jack-10 suited or whatever. Being that I wouldn't have a whole lot of bluffs in this situation, I decide to bet around a third the size of the pot. But I think sometimes overbetting would also be fine. Just not sure if my exact hand loves doing that. Anyway, I bet 2300 Nick Airball calls with his overpair, and we see the Jack of Hearts on the river. I decide to bet small again. Jack of Hearts shouldn't really change a whole lot. It's kind of a brick. So I do decide to put in another bet of $3,800, which Nick quickly pounces on by raising to 11000 I think at this point, it's obvious that my hand is not best. Second pair, no kicker, probably not a good situation for me once Nick re-raises this river. But if you look back at the hand, I think it's unlikely Nick has anything too strong. In fact, I think the strongest hand he would ever have in this situation is pocket jacks, but aside from that, it would just be over pairs or maybe a hand like ace jack of clubs. All these hands, if you guys think about it, are really just a one pair holding. And even though aces are, of course, a great hand, it is still just one pair. 
And one pair never loves facing a whole lot of aggression. I do think he's got one pair, and I do think we can get away with a bluff here. Also, it's important to balance out the times that I've got hands like pocket nines, seven, eight suited for the flop straight, pocket sixes, pocket fives, maybe jack nine suited for two pair. You know, all these strong holdings that would certainly want to raise for value once again. We can't just be doing that with value all the time, so it's important to find some bluffs, even though it might be difficult in a situation like this. 10-9 suited, I do think, is a good candidate, though. Would definitely prefer to have hands like 9-8 suited or 9-7 suited with some removal to the flop straight, but I don't think that's too relevant in this spot. So anyway, all that being said, I do decide to go for it. Despite not having the best image tonight after getting caught bluffing a few times, I think the play just makes sense, and if it makes sense in my head, I'm going for it no matter what. So that's the plan I set into motion by making it $41,800. Back to Nick Airball now, and he does not seem to love it. We don't get snap called, which is great. I think that means we can eliminate pocket jacks. And sure enough, after some time, Nick turns over his pocket aces, announcing to the table that he's got a tough decision to make. I think at this point, I'm pretty comfortable with my play, no matter what ends up happening. I think it makes sense to do this with my hand, and also, if I were in Nick's spot, I would hate life in this moment. But the good news is that he ends up folding, which of course I am more okay with than if he had called. And we end up winning this pot with what I think is a pretty cool bluff. Luckily ends up working out this time, maybe not next time. Stay tuned on Hustler Casino Live. Anyway, that means the session is going at least a little bit better now. We're not unstuck just yet, but at least it's a moral victory, you know? Perhaps it's a sign of a small heater to come. Let's see as we move to the very next shuffle in which I pick up pocket fives. Will raises to 300 in late position, and I decide to re-raise in hopes of getting it heads up. I am on the button. Looking back, I think I should have just called because, like I said, I'm on the button, and pocket fives doesn't really benefit a whole lot from re-raising as opposed to calling. But anyway, I decide to make it 1,200. Henry cold calls once again in the blinds. He's out here doing his thing. Will calls as well, and we go to a flop, which is chef's kiss. Ace, queen, five giving me bottom pair, and of course leaving the door wide open for one of these guys to have flop top pair, hopefully. Unfortunately, as you guys can see, neither of them did, but we end up getting some action anyway as Henry checks, Will checks, and after I bet 2,500, Will's not done with it just yet, having flopped middle pair. He makes the call, and we see a good turn card. It's the four of diamonds, giving Will a flush draw, and what would have given Henry a set of fours. So, of course, if I knew this was going to be the turn, I would have checked back the flop, but... Can't think about that kind of stuff. Will checks. I decide to continue betting. This time, $8,000. He's got a pair and a flush draw, of course, so he can't fold. In fact, it looks like he might raise for a second, but instead decides to just call. And we avoid any disaster on the river as the eight of clubs arrives, meaning there are no flushes available. It does introduce seven, six as a straight, but after Will calls on the flop, it seems pretty unlikely he's got that exact hand. In fact, I think the only variant of that hand he might have is seven, six of diamonds, but he probably would have check raised that on the turn. Anyway, I'm getting carried away again. Will checks once more. This time I bet around two thirds the size of the pot, but Will's finally done with it with just second pair. He lets it go. Still, we end up profiting around $13,000 in this hand, so slowly trying to crawl back to even as I'm in the game for $150,000. Let's see if we can do that with Ace-10 unsuited. This one's interesting because Nick Airball puts on the $200 straddle, but he is in the cutoff, which is the player to the right of the button. Action then starts on the button. At least those are the rules here at Hustler Casino. Henry folds and Mike X opens to 500 from the small blind. Gets to me in late position. And it's a pretty strong position to be in because the button has already folded and the blinds have already acted. So with ace-10 offsuit, I think we're in good shape to re-raise it and try to get this one heads up versus Mike. I make it 2,000 to go. Nick airball cold calls with ace-7 suited on his straddle. And Mike X calls as well. So we have a three-way going to this flop. It's 10-7-5 rainbow i've got top pair top kicker but i'm in between two players who do tend to have some tricks up their sleeves from time to time so when mike x checks it could go either way here between continuing to bet or checking this time i decide to get sneaky and check it nick airball does not he bets his middle pair for three thousand mike x has top pair second best kicker he calls and of course i've got top pair top kicker i am going nowhere just yet i think about this one for quite a while 
and flirt around with the idea of putting in a very unorthodox raise on the flop after having checked it as a pre-flop aggressor, but instead I decided to keep it normal and call. Turn is great, it's the deuce of hearts which shouldn't really change anything. It does, however, give Mike X a flush draw, so he decides to lead out with his top pair in flush draw. He puts in $10,500. I call now, this hand is getting really weird, and on top of that, I don't love the situation because after Mike X leads out and I just call, Nick can definitely get a little bit frisky with whatever hand he's got since I would never have something too strong after playing it this way, but instead he decides to just fold his second pair. And once again, we get a river that would have caused fireworks. It's the ace of clubs, meaning Nick Airball would have rivered aces up against my stronger aces up. So yeah, all sorts of weird stuff going on tonight. Mike X now decides to check it, and I am going to bet since I have top two pair. Pretty advanced strategies here, huh? I decided to put in two-thirds the size of the pot. This is what I'd bet if I had any bluffs like king-queen of hearts, queen-nine of hearts, king-jack of hearts, you know, seven-six of hearts. You guys get the idea. Mike X wastes no time in snap calling this river bet, which has me wondering if perhaps I should have sized up a little bit. But looking back, I think Mike X was just in a non-believing mood and wanted to try to catch me bluffing. I certainly don't blame him, but unfortunately this time for him, I do have it as I turn over the top two. And we win an $84,000 pot, making 44 k in this one and officially getting out of the hole. With that, we move to the penultimate hand, Ace-Queen. Even better than Ace-10. However, not as fortunate of a flop on this one as you guys will see. In this one, I raise it up to 300. Henry calls in late position with Jack-4 suited. Mike X now re-raises on the button with 9-8 suited. Andy cold calls in the blinds. Now it's back to me. I've got ace queen of spades. It's one of the best possible hands in hold'em. Could be a little better, you know, ace king or huge pocket pairs, but ace queen suited is pretty damn good. So I decide to pounce on what I think are some weak holdings with Mike X re-raising the button. Could be all sorts of stuff and Andy cold calling seems like dead money to me. So I make it 4,800 to go. Mike X calls the additional 3200 and Andy does as well. So we go three ways to a flop of King 5-4 with two hearts out there. There is the King of Spades, which means I could have all sorts of backdoor stuff like flushes and straights. And of course can continue to represent the strong stuff like aces, pocket kings, ace king, king queen suited. You guys get the idea. So when Andy checks, I continue for $5,200. Mike X lets go of his nine high, but Andy comes along with his straight draw. Any two would give him a straight. The turn is not great though. It's the king of hearts, which brings in a potential flush and also makes it less likely I've got a king. Andy checks, and I think I should have bet small here looking back, but I do think checking is also okay. So that's what I do. I check it back and we get a bad river card. It's the three of spades giving Andy bottom pair and officially the winning hand so long as he does not fold. Andy now decides to bet out for $13,000, which I'm not really sure if that is a bluff or a very thin value bet to try to get called by a hand like what I have here. Andy is a very tricky player, so not going to presume to know exactly what this bet was about. But what I do know is I've got A's high and could win here sometimes, but I could have all sorts of better hands to call with. So I decide to let this one go. And we get a little unlucky versus Ace-3 and end up losing a good chunk here. And that, ladies and gentlemen, brings us to the last interesting hand of the night. And it's definitely an interesting one, if I do say so myself. I finally pick up a real hand. Pre-flop, at least. Pocket Kings. That's right. I've got myself Pocket Kings. Not a bluff this time. I raise it up to $500, and we get a bunch of action. Nick Airball makes it $2,000, and then Henry makes it $5,000 on the button. Gets back to me now, and of course, I am going to raise once again. If I'm doing it with all sorts of junk... Definitely going to be doing it with Pocket Kings. Henry made it 5000 so I make it 14000 Nick Airball gets out of the way. Henry calls. And at this point, Andy calls, which has me scratching my head because I have no idea what's going on. And I slowly realize that Andy had cold called the $5,000 four bet from Henry pre-flop. I did not see him flick in the single 5K chip. You know, they're brown, the felt is dark blue, kind of hard to see, and Andy plays pretty quick, which I think is great, but this time I missed it, so I thought this whole time that the hand was just between me, Nick, and Henry. So all this means is that my re-raise pre-flop to 14,000 is just way too small when you consider that Andy is also in the hand, 
And of course, it gives Henry a good price to come along. So I kind of butchered this pre-flop, if I'm being honest. Anyway, here we go. We're off to a flop three ways between me, Andy, and Henry, which comes down queen, seven, five with two hearts. Not the best flop ever since either one of these guys, I guess, could have pocket queens, but I'm not too worried about that. So when Andy checks, I continue betting for $12,000. Henry lets go of his king high. Andy's got top pair, top kicker. He's going nowhere just yet. But we get kind of a lame turn card. It's the four of hearts, which means the flush gets there. Six, eight suited gets there. And that being the most obvious straight draw on the flop. Now, of course, you might be saying to yourself, Mariano, there was all this raising pre-flop. How likely is it that he's got himself 6-8 suited? And I'm going to be honest, I don't know. Andy definitely has some gamble in him, especially later into the evening. So I would not be surprised if he did have 6-8 suited, at least sometimes. But anyway, Andy checks, and I do still have an over pair with the King of Hearts. A very strong hand, and I would also be bluffing here with hands like Ace-King with a heart perhaps ace jack with the heart once in a while that gets adventurous pre-flop so i think continuing to value bet pocket kings with the heart is an important step to take in this hand at this point but for whatever reason i don't end up doing this perhaps a little afraid that andy has flopped himself a set or turned a flush which of course are possibilities and being careful or at least considerate of that isn't necessarily a bad thing, but I do think I should have bet small here. Of course, looking back at his exact hand, it's much easier to say that. In the moment, like I said, I thought we might be up against a better hand sometimes. So I do decide to check it back and perhaps let him bluff the river or value bet a worse hand. However, the river is the five of spades, which pairs the board and Andy checks it once again, which I do think means I have the best hand at this point. But once again, a little afraid of monsters under the bed. I decide to check it back in fear of the dreaded check raise with a boat or a flush, which to be fair, I do think Andy would check twice with a boat or a flush. So not too mad at myself about this one. But if I'm being honest, I've played hands much better than this in the past. Kind of a garbage turn and river execution on my behalf. So not too thrilled about the way this one worked out. But hey, we do end up winning a good chunk of money and end the night up a good amount. That was the last fun one for myself. Hope you guys enjoyed as always. Well, I'm definitely not in shape the way I was in my early 20s, but still had a blast here at the soccer field. We ended up winning 3-0, I think. I'm sure that's what you guys wanna hear about right now. Anyway, um, similar to the poker session you guys just saw, things went pretty well. In that game, uh, it was a little bloody at first. Definitely some action hands, which hopefully y'all enjoyed. But in the end, we came out on top. I ended up winning, I think around 40. I don't remember. This was like 48 hours ago now. Yeah, I don't know the exact numbers, but it was a good night overall. And in case y'all haven't noticed, that's like six or seven wins in a row. Not bad especially considering the way last month went. But anyway, that's all I got for now. Remember, I'll be in Austin in a few weeks at the lodge. So if you guys are in the area, come say what's up. If not, you have the vlog to look forward to, which uh, is definitely gonna be a thing. I really like making videos from when I go to Texas. That's all I got for y'all today. As always, thanks for watching. Good luck at your local tables. See you guys next time. Peace.